All right, we now move to chapter three, obstetrical procedures. And the first one that we will talk about is obstetrical ultrasound. Obstetrical ultrasound has totally revolutionized pregnancy care. When I started my residency in the 1970s, it was just beginning. And the changes that we've seen in obstetric ultrasound are just amazing. I don't think it is possible for a patient to get through pregnancy in the United States with regular prenatal care without getting at least one ultrasound. Ultrasound is an imaging modality with low energy, high frequency sound waves. It has probably been studied more than any other imaging method to see if there are any abnormalities and effects on the fetus. And at the low energy, high frequency waves that we use today, no one has shown any adverse effects on the embryo and fetus, but it always could be that we haven't looked long enough yet. So we always need to be concerned with that. The early ultrasounds were transabdominal. Transabdominal can be used anytime during the pregnancy, but the image quality may not be as good. It depends on the body mass index of the patient. It depends on the presence of scars in the skin. The transabdominal is not very helpful if you have a three or 400 pound patient. The benefit of a transvaginal is it can be used in any patient, whether she's 100 pounds or whether she is 400 pounds. Because you get the transducer in the vagina close to the pelvic organs, you have very high resolution images. The dating accuracy of a first trimester ultrasound is plus or minus five days, which is pretty good. The Doppler ultrasound we can use to assess blood flow. And as we will talk about later with fetal antepartum testing, we can look at umbilical artery blood flow and look at diastolic and systolic flow. And when we're assessing for fetal anemia with alloimmunization, we can do fetal middle cerebral artery blood flow and we look at the peak systolic measurements in those situations. This is a wonderful image. It is 12 weeks and three days, and it shows the fetus in a sagittal plane. You can see that the skull is intact. You can see that there is normal appearing spine. There is no spina bifida. You can see the abdominal wall is intact. There's no omphalocele or gastroschisis. We can see the mandible, the maxilla. We can see the nasal bone. This is a beautiful appearing normal first trimester ultrasound. And the accuracy in terms of dating is plus or minus five days. The indications for obstetrical ultrasound are many. In fact, you could almost say that there is an indication for every pregnancy. In terms of ectopic pregnancy, to identify is it in the uterus? That's something we talked about. Viability to see is there cardiac motion? We talked about that when we're looking at first an early pregnancy bleeding. Gestational age dating is very important. And the earlier in pregnancy the ultrasound dating is performed, the more accurate it is. If there are subsequent ultrasounds, we do not change the due date. We just look to see is there appropriate or inappropriate growth. Multiple gestation, twins and triplets and quadruplets, the only way to definitively diagnose that is by obstetrical ultrasound. Amniotic fluid volume is part of our modified biophysical profile, which we'll talk about later on. If the uterus is smaller than dates, oligohydramnios may be a cause for that. We can assess serial measurements for fetal growth. That's going to be important in patients who have chronic hypertension, who have diabetes. They may be the fetus is, is too small or the fetus isn't growing adequately. We can evaluate fetal well-being with ultrasound, specifically with a biophysical profile, where we look at gross body movements, we look at extension and flexion of extremities, we look at breathing movements. The assessment of fetal anomalies is gonna be important as we do the genetic sonogram to identify is there a placenta previa where there is pregnancy bleeding. And as I talked about just a minute or so ago, with fetal anemia, we can look at the middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity 
to see if there's evidence of fetal anemia. We'll talk more about that under alloimmunization. The genetic ultrasound is a procedure which is no different than any other ultrasound, but it is performed specifically to identify if there are any abnormalities, specifically anatomic markers of fetal aneuploidy. The ideal time to do the genetic ultrasound is 18 to 20 weeks. Now, let me just say that this is not a diagnosis of aneuploidy, but what it will do is to change the risk of aneuploidy, because if you have a normal genetic ultrasound, it cuts your predicted risk of fetal aneuploidy by half. In other words, if the likelihood of a given woman's age, let's say at age 35, you have likelihood of Down syndrome of 1 in 300, with a normal ultrasound, it would be 1 in 600. So the generic things that we look for are any structural abnormalities. Is there any evidence of any kind of syndromes? And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of syndromes. But the specific areas that we will look for, which are called genetic markers for aneuploidy, would be nuchal skin fall thickness, which would be at the junction of the neck and the thorax and the head, the shortened long bones, specifically the humerus and the femur. Pyelectasis is where we have enlargement of the renal pelvis. Echogenic intracardiac focus. You can see when you look at the heart that there is echogenic areas which are very clear. And the density should be equal to that of bone. And then is hyperechoic bowel which is also associated with it. So these are the five areas that we look for, with the nuchal skin fold being the one that is the strongest predictor. The nuchal translucency, or NT measurement, is a fairly recent screening test, which is performed in the first trimester, which is between 10 and 14 weeks, and it measures the fetal fluid collection behind the neck. A thickened NT measurement increases the likelihood of aneuploidy and cardiac disease. We combine the NT measurement with two maternal blood tests, which is free beta HCG and PAP-A, which is pregnancy-associated plasma protein A. And by looking at the levels of these two blood tests, along with the NT screening, we can come up with a number giving sensitivity and specificity for aneuploidy screening. So the second trimester screening is a quadruple marker screen, which has four blood tests. The first trimester screening has two blood tests and the NT or nuchal translucency measurement. This ultrasound image shows very well the NT, the nuchal translucency, and you can see down in the lower middle part of the image. The NT measures 2.1 millimeters. You can also see that they have marked the NB, the nasal bone, and they're also looking at the angle between the nasal bone and the head. You can also see the mandible and maxilla. These findings can be very helpful in identifying normality, and they're very reassuring if things look like they should. Chorionic villus sampling is an outpatient office procedure performed under ultrasound guidance without anesthesia. It can be done either transcervically or done transabdominally. A catheter is placed into the precursor for the placenta, which is the chorionic villus. It does not enter the amniotic cavity. It does not go into where the fetus is, but it takes part of the placental tissue. A sample is sent to the laboratory for karyotyping. Because this is an invasive procedure, there is a low but real pregnancy loss rate, which we quote at 0.7%. The basis of the chorionic villus sampling, or CVS, is that the origin of the placenta and the origin of the fetus were both the same, namely the zygote. So whatever the chromosomes of the zygote were should be the chromosomes of the fetus and should be the chromosomes also of the placenta. So if we identify normal placental chromosome, it is highly likely that the fetal karyotype is normal as well. 
there is a very low rate of placental mosaicism. In other words, the placenta may be abnormal, but the fetal uh, chromosomes are normal. That's about one in a thousand. So this is chorionic villus sampling, and this is a first trimester procedure. With the CVS, you do not have any assessment of neural tube defects. When you do an amniocentesis and you take amniotic fluid, you can do amniotic fluid AFP. So the CVS patients are going to have to have the second trimester blood test drawn to assess for neural tube defects. Probably the most common invasive obstetrical procedure is amniocentesis. This is an outpatient procedure which is performed after 15 weeks. The reason it isn't performed between 15 weeks is because there isn't enough amniotic fluid. And if you aspirate the fluid, you can have an increased pregnancy loss. A needle is placed into a pocket of amniotic fluid under direct ultrasound guidance. So you're actually watching as the needle goes through the abdominal wall through into the amniotic sac. And then you aspirate amniotic fluid. The amniotic fluid contains these living fetal cells, which are shed off from the fetal skin, which are called amniocytes, and fetal karyotyping can be performed on the amniocytes. You can also do the amniotic fluid AFP, a more definitive test. The maternal serum AFP is not as specific and as sensitive as is the amniotic fluid AFP, so we will do that. In addition, most commonly, if we have the very precious amniotic fluid, we'll probably do a chromosomes, even if the main purpose is to look for a neural tube defect. The pregnancy loss rate is about 1 in 200, which is about the same as the likelihood of finding aneuploidy at age 35. This is an artist's conception of an amniocentesis, and you can see the blue ultrasound transducer, which is being held on the abdomen by the uh, ultrasonographer. You can see that there is a placenta, which is in the fundus of the uterus. The fetus is in cephalic presentation with the head down, and the needle is placed directly under ultrasound guidance into the amniotic sac, and you can see the aspiration of the amniotic fluid with the amniocytes within it. Pregnancy loss rate is about half a percent. Percutaneous umbilical blood sampling or PUBS is another invasive procedure. A needle is placed transabdominally, goes into the umbilical vein, and we aspirate fetal blood. This is done under direct ultrasound guidance after 20 weeks gestation. And the reason it isn't done before 20 weeks gestation is because the umbilical vein is so small, so tiny, it's difficult to get a needle in. And when you try to do pubs very early, it has a significant pregnancy loss rate. This is done transabdominally. It can be diagnostic. It can be therapeutic. In terms of diagnosis, we can assess blood gases of the fetus, we can assess karyotyping of the fetus. We can assess IgG, IgM antibodies. You can do electrolytes on the blood. In terms of therapy, we can do an intrauterine transfusion if we have fetal anemia, which we will talk about later on under alloimmunization. When you go in through the uterine wall, you can irritate the uterus. You could have preterm contractions. You, you have to go through the membranes, so you could potentially rupture the membranes. Pregnancy loss rate is not high, but it is higher than amniocentesis. It is 1 to 2 percent pregnancy loss rate. The last procedure that we will talk about is fetoscopy. This is performed with a fiber optic scope. It is done in the operating room after 20 weeks gestation under general anesthesia, typically. The scope is going to be larger than a needle, and so the likelihood of rupturing membranes is higher. The likelihood of preterm labor is higher. The pregnancy loss rate is 2 to 5 percent. Clearly, the loss rate will be a function of the experience of the operator. The more of these you've done, the less problems you'll have. Indications for this would be intrauterine surgery. And what is done more and more lately is to do laser vaporization 
of placental vessels which are joining two fetuses with twin-twin transfusion syndrome. And if you don't do a laser ablation before the pregnancy goes much further, you can get either loss of both twins or one twin up to 80% of the time. So this is going to be important. There are rare situations in which you need to do a fetal skin biopsy, and this would be another indication for fetoscopy. The risks, bleeding, infection, rupture of membranes, and fetal loss. This is the highest pregnancy loss rate of any of the procedures. This is a artist's conception of a fetoscope which is placed into the uterus and you can see we have two fetuses one which is stuck on the bottom of the uterus with oligodramnias the other one which is floating in polyhydramnias this is a twin twin transfusion syndrome and the fetoscope is being used to laser the connection between the twin okay let's summarize what we have just said this is on prenatal diagnostic testing in your notes, a chorionic villus sampling is done between 10 to 12 weeks gestation with a pregnancy loss rate of 0.7%, and we aspirate placental precursors. The first trimester screening is done between 10 and 14 weeks, zero pregnancy loss rate because none of these are invasive procedures, and this involves the nuchal translucency and two blood tests, the pregnancy-associated plasma protein A and free beta HCG. The amniocentesis, the most common invasive procedure, is done at 15 weeks or more, a 0.5 pregnancy loss rate, and we aspirate from the amniotic fluid amniocytes and amniotic fluid AFP. We can also do chromosome. The expanded AFP, you can see it is expanded with the X. The X is a shorthand for expanded AFP, it is now the quadruple marker screen. It is done between 15 to 20 weeks. We'll talk about that coming up zero pregnancy loss rate because it's non-invasive and the four tests that we do are maternal serum afp beta hcg estriol and inhibin a the sonogram is probably the most common prenatal diagnostic procedure done between 18 to 20 weeks zero pregnancy loss rate it is non-invasive and this involves a genetic sonogram the fetoscopy is done between 18 to 20 weeks with a three to five percent pregnancy loss rate this can be lasering the blood vessels in twin-twin transfusion syndrome and fetal biopsy. The percutaneous umbilical blood sample, or PUBS, is done at 20 or more weeks gestation, and we have a 1-2% to pregnancy loss rate, and we aspirate blood from the umbilical vein, because that's the largest vessel. And that's the end of Chapter 3.